Hello. Back to Matthew 27. Father God, thank you for this time of study. Thank you for your word. Thank you for another day of grace. Thank you for the insight you will give us, the edification, the encouragement, and the enlightenment. In Christ's name, amen. New Testament video 96 and Matthew lesson 91. Matthew 27. Thus far, we've seen the first five out of seven cries of Jesus Christ from Calvary's cross. He's already cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The second cry, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. The third statement, Woman, behold thy son, behold thy mother. The fourth statement, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The fifth statement, I thirst. And now we're down to the final two. Final two statements that Jesus Christ made on Calvary's cross. So Matthew chapter 27, Matthew 27, Matthew 27, we looked at in our last study, he cries out, Eli, Eli, or Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And we had to go to John's Gospel record for the fifth one, I thirst. Now we're back in Matthew 27. Matthew 27, verse 50. Jesus, when he cried, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. So let's go over to Mark 15, 37. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. Come over to Luke. Luke 23. Luke 23. Now, Luke 23, 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. John. John 19. John 19, 30. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. So what's going on here? Come back to Matthew 27. See, this requires some study. Critical thinking. Contemplation. To get the order, the chronology here. We compare, we search the scriptures. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So come back to Matthew 27. And look at verse 50 again. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. He cried again with a loud voice. What did he cry? John 19 alone has it. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished! And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. What he cried out was, It is finished. The price for Israel's sin, first and foremost Israel, for the transgression of my people, Isaiah 53, verse 8 says, for the sin of my people, that's Israel, was he stricken. 
and through the ministry of the Apostle Paul, we learn now the merits that Jesus Christ achieved at Calvary is not exclusive to Israel. He's come to give his life a ransom for many, Matthew 20, 28. My blood, this is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for many, he said, on the night of his betrayal. For many, that's the nation Israel. Now it says in 1 Timothy 2, verse 6, Christ Jesus gave him, himself a ransom for all. That's the Apostle Paul's ministry. Not just Israel, but Jew and Gentile alike, without any difference. No difference. To be testified in due time. Paul's ministry, that is the due time that the all men message of Calvary's cross is proclaimed. It is finished. The price that had to be paid for our sin debt has been paid in full. These last three hours of darkness, the last half of Christ's six-hour crucifixion, has not been completed. The Father has turned his back on the Son. The Son was made sin for us. He was made a curse for us. His soul was made an offering for our sin. He has drunk every last drop of the cup of God's wrath. Father God's wrath. I will drink of the cup of my Father's wrath. And he has. There's nothing left. The cup is completely empty. And we already dealt with the wrath of Father God that fell upon Jesus Christ on Calvary's altar. Altar. The cross functioned as, as an altar there. I have drunk it in full. Complete, total payment. A propitiation. Romans 3, 25. The fully satisfying payment fully satisfying payment for sin fully satisfying sacrifice father god is now appeased he's now pleased he's now satisfied i accept your work son i accept your work it's perfect the blood the sinless blood of the Son of God was shed completely right here. Romans 5, 8, For God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God commended his love toward us. He presents his love toward us in the form of the cross. So never, never, ever, 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 can we ask the dumb question, how can a loving God send people to hell? We looked at it already in our previous study. The loving God of the Bible did everything to keep us from hell, out of hell. He commends his love toward us. Here, here's my love for you. It's not fickle. It's unconditional. Unlike your love for me, 
it never goes away. My love for you is matchless. It's fully trustworthy. Here, what will you do with my son? What will you do with the sacrifice he made on your behalf? And see, that's personal responsibility now. It's our choice. If we die and go to hell, that's because we don't have the blood of Christ applied to our account by faith. What we did was we said, Oh, that's your love, God. Christ paid the price. What do we do with that love? Okay, if we refuse to believe on God's Son, if we refuse to believe the gospel of the grace of God, what we're doing is we're shoving aside the love of God and saying, No, thank you. I don't want that love. And then, What's the result? We're, we're still dead in trespasses and sins. The debt is still on our account. So guess what? Now it's time for us to pay. Hell and the lake of fire. And we'll never pay it off. Now Christ, he paid that sin debt for three hours. The eternal son of God. He took three hours to pay all of man's sin debt. Every sin for every human being who has ever lived, is currently living, or will ever live. Can you imagine the weight of every single sin, of every single human who has lived, who is living, who will live? It was all dumped on Christ on the cross. His love for us was fully manifested there. So if we shove aside the gospel, we're pushing aside the love of God and we're the ones who are hateful. Not God, not God. How can a loving God send people hell to hell? No, 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 no. The loving God did everything to keep people out of hell. He told them how to escape hell, how not to go to hell. So if we wind up in hell, it's not God's fault. No, no, no. Put the blame where the blame should go. It's on us. It's on us. It's not on God. No. We failed to apply the merits of Christ at Calvary to our account. It was the, the, the righteousness of Jesus Christ can be imputed to us, applied to our account. When we trust him. Or we can continue in unbelief. Stay in trespasses and sins. Dead in trespasses and sins. It's our choice. God does not twist arms. Never forget that my friend. God never twists arms. The God of the Bible values free will so much. So much. He's willing to let people go. To everlasting punishment. If they want that, if they don't want him, his righteousness will be enforced. They lack his righteousness. They lack Christ's righteousness. Can't go into heaven. To go into heaven, you have to be absolutely perfect. 100% perfect. Oh, Brother Sean, how can that be? Nobody's perfect. Exactly. See, you got it. That's what sin is. But there is one who is perfect, the Lord Jesus Christ. I do always the things that please him. We can't say that. Jesus Christ can say that, and he did say it, rightly so. I do everything the Father wants me to do. And you know what the Father wanted him to do? Die on the cross, my son, my beloved son, drink fully from that cup. I will, Abba Father. And he did. It is finished. The payment, all the suffering required to bring somebody out of sin's slave market. All people 
out of sin slave market. There it was. It was paid right there. They appropriated individually by faith. Let me show you. See, just because Christ paid the price, that doesn't automatically mean, oh, everybody goes to heaven now. Romans 3. Romans 3. Listen to Romans 3. The Apostle Paul. Romans 3. 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped. Shh, no argument. Guilty. And all the world may become guilty before God. Guilty, 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 guilty. The law doesn't help anybody do right. It simply shows them they do wrong. Therefore, Romans 3, 20, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in God's sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law says, look, measure up. You have to reach this level. That's where God's righteousness is. Here, here we are, little peons, sinners, and everybody's doing this. Some people are jumping higher than others. Some are lower than others. But, you, but, but look, everybody is falling short. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It doesn't matter how high we jump. Everybody is still short of that righteous standard. Here's what Jesus Christ did. And he jumped all the way up. There's the righteousness of God. He measured up. We don't. When we trust the fact that he did the jumping, then guess what? We jump with him. And now he makes us right on the level of God's righteousness. And now we go into heaven. See that? But we appropriate it by faith. If we want to stay with our spiritual pennies and nickels down here and our little jumps, we can. And see what we'll do. We'll jump off into hell. We won't measure up. Romans 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets pointing out the fact there has to be some other way to reach God besides the law. Works religion, performance-based acceptance system. Run the tread, treadmill. Run, 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 run. When you run the treadmill, the treadmill demands you keep up. And if, if you don't keep up on the treadmill, what happens? Foof! You fly off it. See, the sinner, the, oh, the sinner can... Can do the best he can. Oh, I'm making it. I'm making it. All it takes is a delay in that step. And whoosh. that's why God took, that's why God took away the law system and gave us the grace system through the Apostle Paul's ministry. The dispensation of grace. And now we're not under the perform to get the blessing. See, Israel had to learn. They tried to perform. They tried to get the blessing. Huh, forget it. All they did was get curses. And look what they did. They put their Messiah on the cross. Wicked. Wicked. Wicked, wicked, wicked. Israel had to learn. The promise is not by the law. The, the, the promise is simply what God will do with Abraham and the nation Israel. Because God promised Abraham that he, God, would do for Abraham what Abraham couldn't do. God would make of Abraham a great nation. Not Abraham struggling. Abraham didn't learn that. He had Ishmael, Genesis 16. He struggled and strove, didn't make it. God said, that's not the son. No, Abraham, you, you worked in your flesh. You got that. That's not grace. That's law. Isaac, 
That's the grace, son. Remember when Israel came out of Egypt? They wanted the law too. All that the Lord has said will do. Yeah, 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 sure. They didn't. The nation Israel is like any group of sinners. All sons of Adam, all daughters of Adam. Sinners, 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 sinners. Romans 3, 21. And if the nation Israel was condemned as sinners, the Gentiles were too. Because Israel was God's nation. The Gentiles, oh, they were, they were far worse. They had the idols. They had the darkness. They didn't have the word of God. So if Israel was bad off, how much worse were the Gentiles? Romans 3, 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. It's unto all. It's available to all. All men. That's Paul's gospel message. Jew and Gentile alike. This is not exclusive to Israel anymore. It's not many. It's now all. He's given his life a ransom for all. Christ died to save all. Now, all aren't automatically saved. Oh, he died. Everybody goes to heaven now. No. It says, The righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. It's unto all, but it's only upon, apply, what? All them that believe. It's, a, it's applied to all them that believe. Believe. See? What, what is important here is not simply what the Bible says, but what it does it say. Good Bible study is not merely seeing, oh, that's what the Bible says, but also noticing what it doesn't say in the verse. Now, watch how, in our last study, I told you the average church member, they, they watched church online with the coronavirus now. They don't, <laughs> they don't go to the church building anymore, most of them. They stay at home. Okay? Whether we're watching it on TV, whether we're watching it on the internet, or where we're going, whether we're going in person. Whatever it is, here's, here is what most of Christendom is hearing. Watch. Romans 3.22. And let me read it. How they have heard the gospel, supposedly the gospel. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that say the sinner's prayer, them that walk the aisle, them that confess their sins, them that repent and feel how sorry, real sorry for their sins. <laughs> to them that are water baptized, to them that confess their sins, to, to them that are filled with the Holy Ghost, with the initial evidence of speaking in tongues. Battle against hate, blah, 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 blah. To them that give alms, to them. To them that join the church. To them that sing in the choir. To them that engage in praise and worship. No, no, see, see all that stuff. I just stuck in the verse that the, the verse didn't say anything about that. What is important is believe. Believing is the only thing we can do without doing anything. Belief is not a work of the flesh. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 89. The gift of God is salvation, by the way. It's not faith as the Calvinists claim. Romans 6, 23. Listen. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know what wages are? That's what we work for. That's our salary. 
What, what will sin do for us? The wages of sin is death. Sin will pay us. <laughs> we serve sin, it'll pay us. Wages, plural. One, physical death. Two, spiritual death. The second death. Yeah. But the gift of God, He gives it. We can't work for it, can't work for a gift, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Eternal life is the gift. Romans 4, 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth. See, believing is not a work. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. Faith is counted for righteousness. Rather than us striving, rather than we doing the best we can, we just come to the point and say, no, we can't do enough. We can't measure up. But if we believe, if we trust in Jesus Christ, believing He did enough, then God considers what He did perfectly as though it applies to us. It does apply to us. See? The substitution. Substitutionary atonement. at one minute, Reconciled. Romans 3, verse 22. Even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, no difference between Jew and Gentile. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Jew and Gentile alike, all are guilty. And now, all are qualified to benefit from Calvary's cross. So God put all sinners down on one level. Jew and Gentile alike, so that now by faith they can all come to the level of Christ. Being justified freely, no cost to us, being made right in God's sight, being justified freely by His grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. Through the redemption, the buying back that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Through faith in His blood, God believes. Yes, God has faith. <gasps> God has faith? Somebody asked me one time, ah, a Christian, he said, ah, God has faith. Oh, sure. Know why? Faith. Faith is believing God's Word. Don't you think God would believe His own word? I think He would. Otherwise, it'd be a lie. And He wouldn't be God if He'd lie. God cannot lie. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. God the Father believes that Jesus Christ's blood is a propitiation for our sins. Do we believe that, though? Do we agree with God? Yes or no? Yes, we trust Him. No, don't trust Him. Our choice. To declare His righteousness. His righteousness, not ours. It's not, let's, let's strive and measure up with the, how many commandments we keep. Look, my righteousness. It's my righteousness. Look, look at the commandments I kept. No, that's not the issue. Our righteousness is not enough. Self-righteousness is not enough. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, His righteousness. That He might be, the, be just and the justifier. He makes us right in God's sight. In His sight. The justifier of Him. Which, what? Believeth in Jesus. See? Where is boasting then? It is excluded. You know why boasting is excluded? Because it's not by works. By what law? Of works? Nay, by the law of faith. The law of faith cancels boasting because it's not by works. 
if we would work, then, then we could say, look what I've done. Look what I've done. Look what I've done. I did more than you. No believers in Christ can say that because they all know it's not their performance that matters. Every believer in Christ is depending on the same exact righteousness of Christ. Christ's righteousness applies equally to every believer. There's no people more saved and less saved here. They're all saved, and anybody who doesn't believe, they're all lost. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law, without the deeds of the law, without the deeds of the law. Make that clear. Make that clear. Because there, there is always somebody who will come along and say, faith and works. James 2, James 2, James 2. Before we quote James 2, verse 24, James 1, 1 to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. If we don't know what tribe we're from, we shouldn't be grabbing the 12 tribes mail. Are you a member of the nation Israel? What tribe are you from? I don't know. There's a high possibility you may not be one of the 12 tribes of Israel. You may not be Israel, so don't grab Israel's Bible. Don't grab the part of the Bible applicable to Israel and make it your own. The spiritual larceny. Stealing other people's mail. Thieves. And that's why people get confused. They grab things out of the Bible. No context. They wear their denominational eyeglasses and they force verses to fit their church, their denomination. And when they wind up in hell, it won't be God's fault. When they pervert the salvation verses. And they, they pollute the gospel of grace. It's not God's fault. Not his problem. He got, they got confused. He made his word. He gave it to them. He wrote his word. He gave it to them. He told them to rightly divide it. They don't do it. Well, that's their problem. Not his. All right. It's finished. The work to bring us to God is finished because of Calvary. He suffered on the cross of Calvary. The Son of God suffered on those last three hours, particularly, all the wrath of God against our sin. Three hours. If we refuse that, and we die without Him, you know how long it'll take us to pay that sin debt that He paid in three hours? It'll take us forever. We'll never pay it. Never pay it. Christ's final statement from the cross. Number six was, it is finished. It is finished. Number seven, here it is. Luke 23, 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, it is finished. He said, Father, into thy hands I command my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Notice this last statement. The Lord Jesus said, Father, Father. Remember, in our last study, the Godhead, the Trinity, was split. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? For the first time ever, in eternity past, Read in John 17. The Father, God the Father and God the Son, Jesus Christ, had unbroken fellowship. Long before there ever was a creation, the Holy Spirit was there too. The three members of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, they fellowshiped. They had communion with each other, going all the way back forever. But the Bible says, God has always existed. He had unbroken fellowship in a triune form, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The three persons of the Godhead, they had 
absolute, complete harmony, communion. Sin changed that. At the cross, on the cross, Jesus Christ was abandoned. The Father abandoned him. The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit abandoned him. He was made sin for us. While he was not a sinner, he was punished as though he were a sinner. He knew no sin, but he was made sin for us. He was not acquainted with sin. Now the communion, the fellowship, the relationship he has with his father is restored. Father, the three hours of darkness are over. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. The cup is empty. The cup of the father's wrath is empty. The Lord Jesus has drunk from it. There's nothing left to suffer. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. The payment has been made in full, and now the Lord Jesus Christ lets himself die. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. That too is Bible prophecy. Fulfilled Bible prophecy. Book of Psalms. The book of Psalms. Psalm 31, 5, into thine hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. That's David. And Christ quotes that, fulfilled prophecy. Into thine hand I commit my spirit. John 10, John chapter 10. Verse 18. We'll start at verse 14. John 10, 14. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. The shepherd lays down his life. For the sheep and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. That's Israel and Judah united. One nation, one kingdom again. Back under one government. Therefore doth my father love me, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. Verse 18. Here's the verse that we really want to underscore. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Jew and Gentile alike conspire to put Christ on the cross to kill him, huh? But really, he chose when to die. No man, no other man can do that. I'm laying down my life. I chose. We're looking now from the cross. The cross is perspective. I chose, I choose to lay down my life into thine hands, Father. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. My pneuma, also translated ghost spirit there. I lay down my life. Nobody took it from me. I lay it down. I laid it down. And by the same token, just as he laid down his life, what does he say? I have power to 
to take it up again. There's his resurrection. Yes, I'll die. I'll choose to die. But I will also choose to come back and conquer hell, death, the grave, sin, victory. We haven't gotten to the resurrection yet, but he has laid down his life. All four gospel records agree. Matthew 27, verse 50. Mark 15, 37. Luke 23, 46. And John 19, 30. The Lord gave up the ghost. That's a euphemism for death there. Such as in Gen Genesis 35:18, Rachel. Genesis 35:18, and it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died. His soul and his spirit are leaving his body here. Genesis 25, 8, Abraham gave up the ghost. Genesis 25, 17, Ishmael gave up the ghost and died. Genesis 35, 29, Isaac gave up the ghost. Acts 5, 5, Ananias gave up the ghost. And of course, Herod Agrippa here, the first, he gave up the ghost, Acts 12, 23. So Jesus Christ, his spirit goes back to God as Ecclesiastes. Let me, Ecclesiastes, let me go to Ecclesiastes 12, 7. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, as physical death, the physical body, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So Jesus Christ is dead. His spirit goes to the Father, and his soul goes to the heart of the earth. We'll say more about that later as we get to the end of Matthew 27. Where did he go? What did he do? In those three days, he was dead, physically dead. He's still alive spiritually. He didn't cease to exist. The Lord is still in existence, but not physically anymore. He's in an invisible spirit right now. So he's dead. The king of Israel is dead. He gave up his life. And behold, Matthew 27, 51, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, shaking, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city and appeared unto many." Hmm. There's a lot of doctrine here. Many issues to cover. The veil of the Jerusalem temple is torn into rip. The order is important. The method of the tear is important. The veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Top to the bottom. Top to bottom is important. A man 
didn't care of this. God himself, from the top to the bottom, ripped the veil of the temple. According to the Mishnah, this curtain here, this veil, was 60 feet or 18 meters long. 30 feet, 9 meters high, and as thick as a man's palm. It was so heavy, it took 300 men to lift it when wet. When it was wet, it took 300 men to lift it up. This curtain, this veil, is huge, massive. No man did this. Almighty God did it. He took the veil and he ripped it in half. This was the partition between the holy place and the most holy place. Behind this veil, once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would enter with animal's blood and make atonement for his sins, his houses, household sins, and the sins of the people of Israel. The animal's blood that he put on the mercy seat, the lid of the Ark of the Covenant that was behind the veil, the presence of God that would hover over the mercy seat between the cherubim there. This veil hides the Shekinah glory, God's presence. Why was the temple veil rent here? Why was the temple veil rent? We'll get to that in a moment. A lot of confusion, of course. About everything in the Bible, there's always confusion. Because denominations and traditions and speculations cloud the clarity. In Exodus 26, 31, Exodus 26, 31, here is the veil as it was in the tabernacle. Now, the veil being torn in the temple there, that's Herod's temple, 1,500 years after Moses. That is a thousand years after Solomon's temple, which was the first temple. And Solomon's temple was approximately 500 years after the tabernacle here, which is Moses' ministry, Exodus 26, 31. And thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen of cunning work, with cherubims shall it be made, and thou shalt hang it upon four pillars of sheet of wood, overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be of gold upon the four sockets of silver. And thou shalt hang up the veil under the tashes, that thou mayest bring him thither, within the veil, behind the veil, in other words, the ark of the testimony. And the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy place. The holy place, that was the daily menstruation there. The candlestick, table of showbread, the altar of incense. And the most holy, that is the Ark of the Covenant's room. That's the mercy seat's room behind the veil, the most holy. And thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the Ark of the Testimony in the most holy place. And thou shalt set the table without the veil and the candlestick. We have the candlestick over against the table, across the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south. And thou shalt put the table on the north side. And thou shalt make an hanging for the door of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twin linen wrought with needlework. And thou shalt make for the hanging five pillars of sheet of wood and overlay them with gold and, and their hooks shall be of gold, and thou shalt cast five sockets of brass for them. Exodus 36, 35 and 36. Hebrews 9, 1 to 7. That was the tabernacle's veil. Solomon's temple had a similar veil, and now Herod's temple has a similar veil, dividing the holy place from the most holy place. 
Now, why was this veil rent? Why was it torn? Why was it torn? Some will claim that the Mosaic law was abolished at the cross. Others will say that the dispensation of grace began right here. They say that the rending of the veil means there's no longer a difference between Jew and Gentile. And now everybody has access to God. While all of that seems to be true, it isn't. None of it is true. None of that is true at this point in Matthew 27, 51. For example, it is Bible ignorance. And that's what it is, okay? It's Bible ignorance for anybody. Anybody. Anybody and everybody. Dr. Schofield was wrong. The dispensation of grace, it does not begin at the cross, did not begin at the cross. The law did not end at the cross. The Mosaic law did not end at the cross. Grace did not start at the cross or after the cross like this. The, the, the veil of the temple being torn here doesn't symbolize the dispensation of grace beginning. Does it symbolize the law being abolished? Does it mean that the middle wall of partition is being torn down and that there's no difference between Jew and Gentile because Christ died here? The dispensation of grace, the dispensation of the grace of God was committed to the Apostle Paul's trust. That's Ephesians 3.2. And if that verse is true, and I assume it is, maybe I'm wrong, I believe... Ephesians 3, 2 is right, that the dispensation of grace was committed to the Apostle Paul's trust, like the verse says, then that means that the dispensation of grace didn't begin in Matthew 27, 51. Why? Paul's still a lost man. Saul of Tarsus is a lost man. He won't get saved for another year. Acts 9. There's no way the dispensation of grace is in Matthew 27. We don't find the body of Christ in Matthew 27. We find the Mosaic law in Christ's earthly ministry, even after the cross. Watch. Matthew 5. Matthew 5. Matthew 5, 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. What are we talking about now? 17, the law. 18, the law. Till all be fulfilled. Now, 19. Whosoever, therefore, shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them. Now, what would be the them here? Whosoever shall do and teach them. Teach what? The commandments, the law, the law. The same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. The law is to be taught here in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Christ told his audience. Now see, we know, we know dispensationally delivered here. The Bible says Christ's earthly ministry is to Israel under the law. Galatians 4, verse 4, Christ was born under the law. Okay. The law's operating. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You see the temple worship going on in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You see the observance of the feasts, Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles. You see the animal sacrifices here. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The law is being promoted here. Christ told his disciples, the nation Israel, Israel's little flock, he said, he's speaking to the nation Israel, I am sent not to Gentiles, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 15, 24. He even told his apostles, don't go to the Gentiles, don't go to the Samaritans, the half Jew, half Gentile Samaritans. Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
Matthew 10, 5 through 7. Christ said this in Matthew 23. He's speaking to Israel, of course, not to us. Matthew 23. He spake, Je then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. What would that be? That would be the law, huh? All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. The law, do, observe and do the law. When the scribes and the Pharisees teach the pure word of God, the Mosaic law, obey them, but don't be hypocrites like they are. They say and they do not. They really don't follow the law, but they claim they do. It's all phony, fake, put on, hypocrites. When they teach the pure law of Moses, little flock, Obey the scribes and the Pharisees. When they pollute it with traditions, speculations and opinions, rabbinical tradition, ignore them. Now, Matthew 28, Matthew 28, 19, after his resurrection, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Teach them what I have commanded you. Teach the nations what I have commanded you. Well, what did he, what, what did he command the little flock there? <laughs> the law. He told them to keep the law. Okay. Even after the cross, the law is still the issue. The law has not been done away. Luke 24, 53, Luke 24, 53, here, after the resurrection, they were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. That's Israel's little flock. Doesn't sound to me like they weren't under the law but under grace. They're still in, in the temple. They're still under the law. They think, and Jesus didn't tell them, don't worship in the temple. They are in the temple. Acts 2, 46. Acts 2, 46. This is after the cross. This, it sounds to me like they're still under the law. The, all, the law is still operating. Acts 2, 46. And they continuing, continuing daily with one accord in the temple. Acts 3, 1. Peter and John go to the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. Huh? Doesn't that sound like the law? Yes, it does. Yes. Acts 5, 20. You go on and on and on with this. Acts 5.20. Acts 5.20. Go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. They're still going to the temple. The cross of Calvary did not abolish the difference between Jew and Gentile either. The middle wall of partition, Ephesians 2, between circumcision Jew and uncircumcision Gentile, that difference is still being respected after the cross. Luke 24, 47, here, after the cross, watch. There's the rending of the veil had nothing to do with the dispensation of grace beginning and the law ending. Nope, the law's still going on after the cross. The dispensation of law will not end until St. Paul's ministry, Acts 9. The dispensation of grace committed to his trust, Ephesians 3, 2. The splitting of the veil of the Jerusalem temple did not signify the difference between Jew and Gentile being abolished. No, there's still a difference between Jew and Gentile. Look at Luke 24, after the cross. Luke 24, 47. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations. And don't stop reading. Beginning at Jerusalem. Beginning at Jerusalem. See, Israel still has the preeminence. Israel is still above the nations here. Acts 1, 8. Acts 1, 8. 
See, we have to understand this dispensationally. Otherwise, we don't have a prayer in the world understanding what's going on in the veil, being torn. Acts 1.8 But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. See the order? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. Jerusalem, capital city of Israel, the city of the great king. Judea, that's the area around Jerusalem, the southern Israel. What's the next place? Samaria, that's northern Israel. Remember the split kingdom? Israel, Judah, north, south. Samaria, Judea. And unto the uttermost part of the earth. That's the rest of the world. But see the order? The order. Jesus didn't tell them, go to anybody and everybody. No difference. There is no difference. There is a difference in Luke 24. There is a difference. Acts 1. There is a difference. Acts 2. Peter restricts his message. Remember, there are, there are Roman soldiers all around here in Jerusalem. The Apostle Peter, as the Spirit of God gives him utterance, the day of Pentecost, the Apostle Peter, Acts 2. What does Peter preach? Acts 2.14, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem. Verse 22, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly. Who's Peter preaching to? Israel. Not that hard to understand. Unless we have a denomination that says, Oh, there's no difference after the cross. The cross did away with the difference, and now all Jews and all Gentiles are equal in God's sight. Not at this point, not at this point. Acts 4, verse 10, Acts 4, 10. Be, known, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you. Acts 5, Acts 5, verse 31. Him hath God exalted as Christ. You hanged Christ on a tree. A wooden execution. Structure. A tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. See how this is restricted to Israel? So the middle wall of partition is still up post-resurrection, which means the cross didn't do away with the middle wall of partition. Ephesians 2, the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile, circumcision and uncircumcision, is not abolished at the cross, is not broken down at the cross, is not broken down until Paul's ministry, Acts 9. All right. So, the rending of the temple veil. What did it not signify? We'll deal with that first. We dealt with that first. The rending of the veil of the temple did not signify the law ending and the dispensation of grace beginning. No. Wrong. Next one. The rending of the temple veil did not signify all Jews and all, and all Gentiles are now on one plane before God. No, there's still a difference between Jew and Gentile. Anybody reading with common sense and no denominational bias reading the early Acts could ever say, Oh, Jew and Gentile are alike. They can all come to God by faith. And that the gospel is going to all people. Not in early Acts. Acts 2, we just read. It's not true. Acts 3, Acts 4, Acts 5. So, why 
was the temple of Elrian. Two reasons. We can offer two reasons. And you should remember these verses already. Matthew, we covered this already. Matthew, Matthew 23, Matthew 23, the final verses of Matthew 23, Matthew 23, 37. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that thou that killest the prophets. And stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Ye would not. Is it God's fault? Mm -mm. No. See, be sure to put the blame, my friend. Be sure to put the blame where the blame belongs. Jerusalem is the one at fault. God would send the prophets, the messengers, to Israel, to Jerusalem. Come back to me. Come back to me. Keep my law. Keep my commandments. Don't worship and serve idols. And what would Jerusalem do? Jerusalem would kill God's messengers to her. We don't, we don't care. We don't care to hear God's word. Go away. And they would stone God's preachers. How often, God says, would I have gathered thy children together? Often, 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 over and 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 over for centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries. God kept calling Israel for 1,500 years, especially Moses to Christ. Come back to me. Come back to me. Keep the Mosaic law. Don't engage in idolatry and bell worship, paganism, heathenism. But Israel didn't care. God kept extending his hand, long suffering, the forbearance of God. God put up with it over and over and over. I'm, I'm calling you back to me. Even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. It's their fault. He tried to get along with them and they didn't want him. Okay, so now, behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Your house. Back in Matthew 21, he had said, the temple is my house. John 2, at the beginning of his ministry, he said, this is my father's house. Matthew 23, 38. Behold, it's your house, Israel. Enjoy. It's your house. And your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. That's his second coming. That's his return. Matthew 24, 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. That's it. God has left the building. Your house, Israel, not my house, not my father's house. Have it. You don't want me, you don't want my father. That house is empty. It's desolate. And in Matthew 24, verse 15, the abomination of desolation, now that the temple is desolate, 2 Thessalonians 2, it's ready to receive the Antichrist. Israel gets the lie. Don't want the true Messiah? Here, enjoy the false one. Counterfeit. God's presence, the Shekinah glory, dwelt behind that veil. When that veil was ripped at Christ's death, there, the most holy place was exposed. And Israel could see right through. God is gone. The glory, the Shekinah glory. That aura of light, that ball of light, that sphere of light that hovered over the mercy seat is gone. God has left Israel. They don't want his son, they don't want him. 
He's left the temple desolate. Now the priests, they would have been offering the evening sacrifice at this time, remember? Animal sacrifices being offered. They, they surely witnessed that temple veil. And I'm sure they wondered, what in the world is happening? Who did this? Oh, they knew who it was. Couldn't have been man. It was God himself. I don't know how true this is. Probably is true. It has been said that the priests patched up the veil, stitched it together the best they could, and kept on with their worthless temple sacrifices there in unbelief. They didn't want the true Messiah. Got the false one. Christ said, you'll get the false one. They will get him. He's coming. The Antichrist is coming for Israel. The time and the priests were offering the animal sacrifices. They're preparing to slaughter the Passover lambs right here. Little did they realize right here at 3 p.m. the Passover lamb capital P capital L the Passover lamb the son of God the ultimate sacrifice for sin was made right there on Calvary's cross not in the temple, outside of Jerusalem it was offered. And God accepted that one. The temple veil was rent in order to expose God's absence from the most holy place. Now, there was later revelation given to the writer of the book of Hebrews. The writer of the book of Hebrews was not Paul, okay, Whoever, whomever God used to write the book of Hebrews, it doesn't matter. Okay. The first word of Hebrews, Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says, God, God wrote the book of Hebrews. God, the Holy Spirit. Okay. The human instrument makes no difference. Even if Paul did write Hebrews, the doctrine is still for the Hebrews. Israel, not us. Nothing in Hebrews Is directed toward us. Romans through Philemon, that's to and about us. Those are Paul's epistles. This was later revelation. Hebrews 10, Hebrews 10, 19. Why was the temple veil rent? Second reason. Hebrews 10, 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, as flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Israel's believing remnant can say this now. Through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, the temple veil symbolized the flesh of Christ as the flesh of Christ was torn on the cross. That veil being torn symbolized his flesh being torn. Through the veil, that is to say his flesh, his blood being shed makes it possible for Israel to approach God in a new way. The cross allows Israel to approach God, not through the Old Covenant, the First Testament. Read all of Hebrews 8. Read all of Hebrews 9. Read all of Hebrews 10. The Old Covenant will be set aside. And now that the, the New Covenant can be ratified. Now the New Covenant has not been given yet. A new and living way. That's the new covenant. The new covenant will be established, ratified at Christ's second coming. 
if we go to Romans, Romans 11, Romans 11, 25, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away in godliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Jeremiah 31, the new covenant. He's taking away their sins. That at, that's at his second coming. Christ returns. Acts 3. Acts 3. Just prior to the millennium. Acts 3, 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted, the apostle Peter is preaching to Israel, that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshment shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. Their sins, their national sins, will be blotted out when Jesus Christ is sent to them, his second coming. Whom the heaven must receive, he's away in heaven for now, until the times of restitution of all things, then he comes back. Which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. The new covenant can now take the place, at the beginning of the second coming, can now take the place of the old covenant. Now, let's go back to Matthew 27. Matthew 27. So why was the temple veil rent? The temple, temple veil was rent in order to expose the fact that God is no longer in the temple. Vacant. It's vacant now. He's vacated it. But also, and this is later revelation, not known at the time of Matthew, but known from the book of Hebrews written decades later. Now the old covenant can give way to the new covenant. The blood that was shed, Hebrews 8, Hebrews 10, especially Hebrews 10, the blood that Christ shed at Calvary, just like the old covenant, Exodus 24, was ratified with blood, animal's blood, so the new covenant will be ratified with blood as well. That's the blood of Jesus Christ, especially Hebrews chapter 10. Read Hebrews chapter 10. I have to move along. Matthew 27, 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. God did it to expose the fact that he's no longer there, as well as what we'll see later in Hebrews, what they'll see later in Hebrews. The new covenant can now be established with Israel. And the earth did quake. The veil was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. It was because of this massive earthquake that Judas' body hanging, Matthew 26, no, Matthew 27, Judas' body hanging, Matthew 27, it fell in Acts 1. It was all mangled as it fell from its high point, and Judas was disemboweled and Enough of that, okay. Matthew 27, 51. So there's this massive earthquake. The rocks were rent and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection. And came out of the graves after his resurrection. Please make sure you get that. Matthew 27, 51. Three says, after his resurrection, these saints came back from the dead. They weren't resurrected when he died. They weren't resurrected here. It says, their graves were opened here when he died. The, the earthquake split them open. But they didn't come out alive until after he resurrected. Be sure you get that order right. People get confused and mixed up here. Matthew 27, 52. They think they came out of the grave, out of those graves, when Christ died. 
I thought Jesus was supposed to rise first. He did. See, read. Read 53. They came out of the graves after his resurrection. Now, what's going on here? I will save this for Matthew 28. We don't have time in this lesson. There's some typology in the Old Testament that foretold this. We'll look at it later. For now, we will see the fact that these saints, and see, these weren't people who were lost and they got a second chance to be saved. No, they were already saved people. They're saints. They were already justified in God's sight. They didn't escape torments and, oh, now you have a second chance to believe the gospel. No. They came out of paradise, Abraham's bosom. They went into the holy city and appeared unto many. They went into Jerusalem and appeared unto many. These individuals, they must have recently died. These believers died not too long ago. Because here they are visiting with people who used to know of him. And they're, they're recognized. Hey, aren't you supposed to be in the grave? No, I'm out of the grave. <laughs> Ooh, we buried you last week or months ago. Yeah, you did. I'm back. Huh? <laughs> Ooh, I'm sure, I'm sure that made some people, uh, you know, joyful, but also uncomfortable. Aren't the dead supposed to stay in the cemetery? They were resurrected after Christ resurrected for a particular reason. Do you want me to tell you now, or should I make you wait? <laughs> Please tell us now. Please tell us now. <laughs> I can hear. Uh, I will give you a partial answer. So that Jesus Christ's resurrection is validated in order to strengthen the evidence for a resurrection and not merely, oh, this is some fainting or swooning. Oh, Jesus didn't really die. He fainted. He swooned in the grave for three days. He didn't really die. He was just unconscious for a while, for a few days. Because after all, like a professor of mine used to say, science can't explain resurrection. Yeah. There are plenty of things science can't explain. Science has limitations because scientists have limitations. We have limited brains. We use just a fraction of the human brain on a daily basis. A couple percentages. What, five? Four? Four percent? I don't think anybody has ever gotten above five except Adam and Eve. And of course, Jesus Christ, 100%. If all these people resurrected with Jesus Christ, I guess they were all swooning too, huh? They had all fainted as well. See, it would be much harder to, to disprove resurrection if there are a lot of them. See, if there's just one, you could, you could dismiss that as, oh, he wasn't really dead. It was fainting. Well, you know what? All these weren't really dead then. They all fainted. And they were all buried alive. Now see, the likelihood of that would be far less. So, these saints coming out of the grave after Christ's resurrection, he'll be resurrected in chapter 28, they are further proof of his own resurrection. You can't disprove them all. See, It's much harder to refute. The evidence is stronger if it's a mass resurrection here. Now, what happened to these saints? Well, there's nobody on earth 
alive today, who's 2,000 years old. Jesus Christ alone hath immortality, 1 Timothy 6. These saints didn't get glorified bodies here. No, I don't believe. Jesus Christ alone has immortality. He can never die again. He alone has a body that will never die again. Matthew 27 here. These people, they weren't living for centuries more up in heaven in those bodies. They must have died again sometime later. We don't see them going up with Christ at his ascension. In Acts 1, they see Jesus Christ going up. They don't see these individuals going up with him in bodies. It's just Jesus Christ there. It's just Jesus Christ in Acts 1 ascending. So I would conclude the saints in Matthew 27. What happened to them after they were raised again? They must have died. They must have died. Just like Lazarus. Just like the, 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 the widow of Nain, her son. That little boy, that man, he died again. The little girl, Jairus' daughter. Christ raised her from the dead. She died again. All right. So, whoopee, we covered four verses. We have a lot to cover in our next lesson. So we'll stop here. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Christ dying for our sins according to the scriptures. Thank you for him being buried. Thank you for him being raised again according to the scriptures. That we would simply believe on him and be justified in your sight forever. A home in heaven. Justification, sanctification, redemption, Love, mercy, grace. Thank you in Christ in your name. All right. So one, two, three, four. We'll start fifty-four next time.